on the road to Kathmandu for an event of international importance, the coronation of a king who has inherited a throne at a troubled spot in the East-West conflict. The remote Himalayan principality of Nepal is still in the Asiatic Middle Ages, until recently dominated by hereditary prime ministers, the Ranas, who were overthrown a few years ago. King Mahendra, now to be crowned as the ruling sovereign. This may be a last glimpse of the traditional splendor of Asia, but it's also an affair of ultra-modern power politics. New Delhi, capital of independent India. That dome palace, the residence of the president of India, surrounded by handsome government buildings. massive old red fort built by the Emperor Shah Jihan, the magnificent Mughal. Geography, political. North of India, the towering Himalayas, beyond which lies Tibet under the domination of Red China. Nepal, in between the new India and the power of communism. Kathmandu, forbidden to outsiders until recently. The Indian delegation, headed by the Vice President of India, Dr. Sarvapali Radhakrishnan, philosopher, statesman, and diplomat, which reflects Indian interest in this highly strategic realm of Nepal. In a counter move of power politics, the Chinese Reds have sent an imposing delegation, headed by no less than the Vice Premier of China, Ulan Fu. Communists at a coronation may seem odd, but the Chinese Reds are quite willing to play a game of intrigue at a royal court. The stakes are high. Possible control of Nepal on the Indian side of the Himalayas. The American delegation arriving in Kathmandu, including magnetic Mrs. Robert Lowe Baker, prominent in civic and political affairs of Washington and New York. Accompanied by our tall acting ambassador in India, Frederick Bartlett and his lady. Over there on the left, a world famous name in medicine, Dr. Charles Mayo of the Mayo Clinic with Mrs. Mayo. Oh, yes, there is one other member of the American delegation. United States the only country to send three full ambassadors to this Himalayan coronation. The chief of protocol, Sardar Prakat Man Singh, meets me with a most impressive 1929 Buick. License number, if you can read it, 46. The 46th automobile ever to reach this country. <laughs> The 
forests of Nepal are famous for their herds of wild elephant, many of whom are captured and tamed. Kathmandu traffic hazards include elephants. about to drive over an American steel bridge, every part of which was carried over the mountains by men. Frantic last-minute decorations are going up everywhere. The legend is that the tree of paradise, taking the form of a man, strolled into this valley, liked it, and promised to send some sacred wood for a shrine, which he did. Cat, meaning wood, Mandu, structure. A city of a quarter of a million people, with hundreds of temples and shrines. After saying a prayer, this Buddhist monk places a flower on his head. Many Nepalese still adhere to the aboriginal spirit and demon worship of Bumpoism, others to Hinduism, and many are Buddhists. This image of Kali the destroyer tells us that it is a land of exotic religions. God Vishnu, many Nepalese call him Narayan, reclining on the serpent of eternity, sculptured more than a thousand years ago. The burning gods where the dead are cremated, just as in India along the Ganges. Ashes thrown into the river where children splash and play. In the distance now, the main range of the Himalayas, nearly a hundred miles off, a land of mountain and jungle trails. But for some 30 years, the rich Rana nobles imported a few automobiles. All of them brought over the mountains from India in this way. It takes a hundred or more men to carry a car, depending on its weight. The contractor and his assistant, why should they walk? What difference do an additional two or three hundred pounds make? <laughs> Meanwhile, from one of the palaces to which visiting ambassadors are assigned, we ride in state to present our credentials to King Mahendra in silk topper and striped pants. All delegations instructed to bring formal clothes. Look who's here, on his way to the coronation. The Sarge substituting for the Himalayan boss man. Still the crew chief. Two holy men from India looking for nirvana. 
or whatever Hindu holy men look for. to present my credentials, accompanied by Chuda Prasad Sharma, the Nepalese foreign minister, and by Paul Rose, head of the American Technical Aid Mission to Nepal, who borrowed his topper from the British ambassador. I am told that I must bow three times before His Majesty. Let's see if I do it right. Majesty, I've come halfway around the world to present the congratulations of my country. May I present Mr. Rose of the United States Mission. Your Majesty, I'm honored. Mahendra Bir Bikram Shah Deva is kept busy with ceremonies and conferences. For long generations, Nepal was ruled by those hereditary prime ministers of the Rana family. But in 1951, Mahendra's father, King Tribhuvana, grew tired of being a puppet, escaped from the palace, flew to India, and then came rebellion in Nepal. And the rule of the hereditary Rana prime ministers collapsed, and the king returned a real sovereign but only for a short time, and upon his death, his son seized the throne. Chinese reds in their severely cut black robes, the uniform of communism. The red ambassador arriving for an audience with the king, escorted by the Nepalese foreign minister, Chuda Prasad Sharma. Behind the scenes, the game of power politics is in full swing. Soon after this coronation event, the news came, a treaty signed between the Chinese Reds and King Mahendra's Nepal. The British delegation, in the blue mantle of a Knight of the Garter, Lord Scarborough, Chamberlain to the Queen, former Air Minister Lord Delisle, General Anderson, a British commander in Malaya, and an Oxford scholar in full academic robes. troops from the British Army fighting the Reds in Malaya. The Gurkhas originally were Rajput warriors in India. Centuries ago, they fled from the Muslim invaders, conquered Nepal, and later the British recruited them for the Gurkha regiments of the Kipling tradition. In 
Lord Scarborough presents a sword to King Mahendra, informing him that he is now an honorary British general. The eyes of Buddha overlooking Kathmandu. Tradition says he was born in Nepal, the teacher of Nirvana and the law. The eyes of Buddha penetrating, inscrutable. Eyes of mystery that see all you do in Kathmandu. Before the entrance to the shrine, pilgrims prostrate themselves and chant, Om Mani Padme Om. Om Mani Padme Om. While the prayer wheels spin, each turn a thousand prayers. Well, what pilgrims are these? Say, you fellows, you're going the wrong way. Your prayers won't be heard at all unless you turn and go the other way. Still looking for their dream world, even in far Kathmandu. The day of the big event. Hanuman Doka Square, named after Hanuman the monkey god. The place of the coronation, just inside the temple courtyard to the right. And more than a million people have thronged into the city from all parts of Nepal. tradition of the gorgeous East, now becoming a thing of the past. China, communist and grim. India, a parliamentary democracy. The little crown prince arriving at the temple courtyard. Regarded as a divinity, a reincarnation of the god Vishnu. In simple white raiment, passing through a golden doorway, he has been purified, anointed with mud from an elephant stable for strength, from the Himalayas for wisdom. He has only one wife, although he could have many, but he prefers monogamy. One queen. Her name, Ratnarama Permission. So now their Himalayan majesties take their places with powerful Cinerama lights illuminating the throne of the nine golden serpents. <laughs> Dr. Mayo and I, among other delegates, have good places, but you in the Cinerama audience have a far better view. The astrologers consulting the stars have calculated the exact minute. 10.43 a.m. And at that instant, King Mahendra is crowned with a diadem surmounted by a plume of the greater bird of paradise.
sword and scepter, emblems of kingship. Then the ritual is done. Like a sinister ghost at the park, the Chinese communists again in black. Then the climax of the Durbar, the coronation parade in a land of elephants. and dismounts a white horse. His every move this day dictated by traditions of old. Platters of flowers for a scattering of petals before the king. Enough to shake the daylights out of you when your elephant gets up. children ride in the carriage, including the crown prince. Up you go, your royal highness. encrusted with hundreds of pearls, diamonds, and emeralds. The golden umbrella, sign of royalty in Southern Asia. Daughters of American officials are invited to take part in the parade. The Sarge talking them into taking him and the Major along, too. Our two fugitives from the machine age who have found themselves in some peculiar situations on this journey, now with a Himalayan coronation for a climax.
Look out, General. such as man in this fast-changing, mechanized world may never see again. Returning home to take another look at the wonderland of the machine age. Then they'll make up their minds. Did they find Shangri-La in the Himalayas? Or will they decide it's right back where they were? We're coming in. Let's wait and see. This is it. Come on, Major. Wake up, Sarge. Hey. technological era of B-47 jet planes, intercontinental atomic bombers. The U.S. Air Force epitomizes the marvels of modern technology, like the mechanism of the Globemaster in this push-button age.
as the promise of a dream like existence. So 